Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. It is Friday, July 3rd, 2015, and I'm Leanne McAdoo. Well, we've got a big show coming up for you tonight. We've watched Mark Dice's video. You know, the people there in California had no idea what they're celebrating on the 4th of July. So we sent Joe Biggs out to see if our friends here in the great state of Texas have any idea why we are celebrating the 4th of July and uh, then we've got a couple of really hard-hitting, in-depth reports for you as well. Um, I'm also going to be interviewing someone about a nice open-source social network that claims to be for the people, as well as another man on the street, to find out just what is racist these days. So all of that and more coming up right after this. I'm Joe Biggs with InfoWars.com. Now, today we've decided to come out to the University of Texas in Austin and quiz students and find out if they actually know anything about this upcoming Independence holiday. You know what uh, holiday we're celebrating this weekend? Yeah, 4th of July. I have no idea. What? <laughs> July 4th, man. I don't Oh, 4th of July. Right? Well, that's a day, though. What's the holiday? Uh, what? Uh, no, I don't. Good for you. Probably July 4th. Yeah, that's probably. It comes after the 3rd. Plus you die. But what's the holiday called? Independence Day. There you go. And you know who we're celebrating our independence from? What tyrannical government? Enlighten me. You got to tell me. I got to tell you. Well, wait a minute now. Independence Day. There you go. Yeah. And who are we celebrating our independence from? <laughs> you guys don't know? Are you going to be celebrating this holiday? Do you know why? And who are we celebrating our independence from? You can, uh, Britain. Britain. Great Britain. Britain. Damn British. There you go. And what kind of coats do they wear? Red. red. red yeah, they're red coats. Do you, do you like those coats? No, I think oh, they're ugly. Is it anything? Great Britain. Britain. What? Look at you. Uh, Britain. Great Britain. No, I don't you know? know. I'm from Mexico, so I know nothing. Uh, we're all from Mexico. Um, let me think. Oh man, our independence. Uh, from um, is it isn't it Mexico or or it's Mexico or Spain, isn't it? I'm going to say uh, Mexico. Um, you put me on the spot. Okay, I'll give you a couple choices if you want. You ready? Okay, give me some choices. China? No. Mexico? Yes. Great Britain? No. Okay. Okay. And uh, what year did we declare independence? 19... Is that right? Am I right? 19... In the 1980s? You're getting close. Is that right? 1989? It's 1989 from Mexico. What? I don't know, man. 1600s, 1700s, 1800s? 1600s. Okay, 1600s. Oh, man. Yeah, I, I can't. 1776. That's what I'm talking about. Let me get a high five real quick. 1744. Okay. 1744? Huh? Is it? Yeah. I'm letting you answer. <laughs> I think it's 1744. Okay. 1796. No, 1776. That, that's what I meant. Yeah. yeah, that's when my university was founded, so I get the two confused. Two important dates, yeah. Do you know what year we got our independence? Oh, no. I don't. Okay. Seven. No? 1776. There you go. Uh, a long time ago. Uh, 1600s, 1700s, 1800s, 1900s? Uh, 1600s. Okay, so give me a day then. Oh, 1776. There you go. 19... No, yeah, it was like, I don't know, 1925? I don't know. All right. And what document did we write and come up with on the... Declaration of Independence. Independence. Ah. So you're saying that sarcastically, but you have to understand there's a lot of people who keep saying Mexico and things like that. Really? Who are from here, yeah. I have, I have no idea. The... It's already got the name in it, kind of. It's got to add a couple other the things. The Declaration of Independence. You got that one. The American Constitution. Okay. No. The Constitution. And it's, um, it's called the Independence. It's Independence Day, so what goes before Independence to make this... Declaration of Independence. There you go. Thank you. The Declaration of Independence. Okay, do you know any of the names of the people who signed it? John Hancock was the first one. <laughs> she knows all the governments. <laughs> well, you got any other names? Yeah, Thomas Jefferson, Benjamin, Benjamin Franklin, Franklin, all the yeah. founding fathers. You know, right? Don't you know? Look at this. Yeah. Uh, I remember Tom's, Thomas or something like that. Um... I don't know who's the guy who wore like the the hat. No, no, he died. Never mind. Um, no, I don't. I don't have no idea. James Madison, George Washington, oh, Thomas man. Jefferson, Benjamin Franklin, maybe. Look at this guy. He used to say where you're from one more time. Saudi Arabia. Well, I mean, I know that it was authored by Thomas Jefferson, um, who is also the founder of the University of Virginia, one of the most important universities in this country. Um, but yeah, I suppose John Hancock. Um, 
a bunch of other dudes. I should know. I watched National Treasure a lot. You know any of the people who signed it in 1989 for Mexico? Thomas Jefferson, right? Yeah. And George Washington. You're on it. There's no, yeah. there's no fool in you. Look at you. <laughs> Knowing your stuff. Mexico, 1989. We celebrate the 4th of July as a reminder of earning our independence from a tyrannical and oppressive government. Just a reminder to the Obama administration, there's plenty of room on the calendar for another holiday. Jade Helm 15, a military exercise of grand scale. The military claims the exercise is for overseas training, yet three of these United States have been listed as hostile. The term mastering the human domain reveals to us that Jade Helm 15 is more than just a military exercise. It's also an exercise of the new field of geospatial intelligence, using human domain analytics to map the politics and thoughts of any nation state, city, right down to the individual. Jade Helm 15. That's what the United States Army is calling a large-scale military exercise. Special Operations Command will be training with other armed units beginning in July. In a recent Infowars.com report, Master the Human Domain, the domestic plan behind Jade Helm, we break down what the Jade Helm logo refers to. In brief, a new discipline in intelligence has been at center stage for the past decade, Activity-Based Intelligence, or ABI. According to TrajectoryMagazine.com, the human domain, or human dimension, which is a vital and integral part of ABI, is defined as the presence, activities including transactions both physical and virtual, culture, social structure, organization, networks and relationships, motivations, intent, vulnerabilities, and capabilities of humans, single or groups, across all domains of the operational environment, space, air, maritime, ground, and cyber. This article goes on to say that the focus on mastering the human domain was born out of a merging of three already existing disciplines of intelligence. That may be the case for this branding of this idea, but the exercise of mapping the human domain right down to the individual is a long-standing institutionalized strategy that has been going on for well over 100 years. What reason would the United States government have to invest so much time, resources, and money in order to pinpoint exact pockets of thought in a country founded on free thought, expression, and most of all, outspoken words against its own government? During his famous farewell address, Eisenhower warned the American people of an imminent and internal threat, a scientific elite. We must also be alert to the equal and opposite danger that public policy could itself become the captive of a scientific, technological elite. The title, Scientific Elite, to most Americans might seem like nothing more than ordinary intangible rhetoric typically thrown around by politicians during their speeches. This time, however, Eisenhower was not speaking in abstractions. There actually is a scientific elite. Jade Helm 15 is anything but the American way. It's a domestic scientific control grid whose purpose is domination and control. A technological infrastructure for authoritarian political control is not the end goal, but a means to that end of eugenics. The term eugenics, coined by Charles Darwin's half-cousin, Sir Francis Galton in 1883, is a science dedicated to the engineering of the human genome by selectively breeding those humans with what they consider to be desirable qualities, such as intelligence, athleticism, etc., and eliminating those humans without these attributes and all races of humans unlike their own. Out of this, race theory and race science was born. Carl Pearson, a protege of Galton, assembled a biometrics laboratory based out of the University of London in 1907 in order to collect data about people mostly based on race. 
He also published a journal entitled Biometrica, which became very influential with American scientists and financiers who were becoming extremely interested in the concept of eugenics. As this movement grew in popularity, top American industrialists threw their money into the game. Carnegie, Harriman, and Rockefeller were among the top contributors. California became the eugenics capital of the world, while on the East Coast, Cold Spring Harbor Research Facility, located on Long Island, was collecting and storing biometric information on average Americans in order to begin the elimination of families as well as entire races of people. Through the efforts of the California eugenicist, mostly through written pamphlets and endowments mostly from the Rockefellers and Harriman, the eugenics movement found a second home in Germany in the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute. This pre-World War II well-funded international scientific community based around the eugenics movement was cementing its place as a standard in human academia when World War II broke out in full scale. The then CEO of IBM, Thomas J. Watson, worked hand in hand with Nazi Germany. In 1933, it was Watson who enthusiastically helped the Nazi plan and funded their national census, which according to historian Edwin Black in his 2001 publication, IBM and the Holocaust, the 1933 census with design help and tabulation services provided by IBM through its German subsidiary, proved to be pivotal to the Nazis and their efforts to identify isolate and ultimately destroy the country's Jewish, Gypsy, and other minority communities as well as single out political opposition. While much of the world was forever altered by the events of the war, this eugenics-based community remained together. A similar and frighteningly more advanced version of this eugenics-based biometrics program is being tested right now under the name Jade Helm 15. While the term eugenics is no longer used in the mainstream openly, the practice of eugenics is still around and stronger than ever. Jade Helm 15 exercises the next generation of technology in the political domination arena. It is simply another technological step beyond the Cold Springs Harbor Research Facilities Biometrics Program or Thomas J. Watson's Census of Germany and their disciplines developed during the eugenics heyday in the early 20th century are still being practiced and advanced today. Mandatory toxic vaccines, abortion, family courts, contaminated water, and of course biometrics are just a few of the branches that grew out of the original eugenics trunk, still present and dominating over our society today. In 2010, the GeoInt Symposium, an annual geointelligence, geospatial, an activity-based intelligence conference held a presentation entitled Mastering the Human Domain. Geospatial intelligence and human geography were the main talking points. Jade Helm is born and begins to take form. The human domain encompasses the totality of the physical, cultural, and social environments that influence human behavior, explained Admiral McRaven Success in this domain won't be achieved by traditional ground, naval, or air forces. Instead, success in the human domain will depend upon understanding the human terrain and establishing trust with those individuals who occupy that space. The goal is to see if groups of these special forces can move around the civilian population without being noticed, you know, blend in so they can place themselves in strategic positions. McRaven continued by saying, Building understanding of the human domain requires boots on the ground, feeding information into the network. A living active map where human beings are movable real-time landmarks and everyone's personal thoughts, feelings, medical information, belief systems, history, basically every shred of information about the individuals in any region on that map will make up the terrain. When mastering the human domain, the special operators are the masters. They are the key that turns this whole machine on. And regardless of whether the military calls this project activity-based intelligence, ABI, geospatial intelligence, coupled with human domain analytics, what we are looking at is a nexus between private tech firms, homeland security and law enforcement, domestic surveillance, and the domestic use of special forces. How is any of this legal? 
How is any of this not a violation of the Fourth Amendment? In this animated short, Plantopolis, scarcity and poverty are the norm, and the entire population is dependent on smart technology in order to survive. In this piece of predictive programming, we are introduced to what is now known as the Internet of Things, a world of smart machines that are equipped with sensors that will be able to determine all of your physical activities in real time as you interact with machines and objects in your everyday life. Every appliance, tabletop, light bulb, and now even your guns will be connected to the net and equipped with GPS. This data will also be included when analyzing the human domain. The human geographical map is present in the physical world as well as the virtual world. Once the operators of Jade Helm fully master the human domain, these social controllers can then proceed with the next stage of their engineered plan. Local roundup exercises have been videotaped in South Beach, Florida. Our own InfoWars reporters David Knight and Joe Biggs visited a top-secret military training facility to prepare for urban missions here in the United States. Newcomers are making their move like data mining tech company Palantir, who have been working with the military industrial complex for years. Bilderberg member regulars Peter Thiel and Alex Karp founded Palantir using venture capital money from the CIA's NQTEL. And many more startups like this one are on the way. Palantir will now be expanding from the battlefield to the VA. IBM Watson Health Cloud which is now being phased into aid doctors when they're diagnosing patients, will be able to sift through millions of available medical documents a second and form a medical opinion using technologies provided by Palantir. The Watson Health Cloud will not only have access to documents, but it will track, trace, and store people's medical conditions in live time via the latest fitness wristbands, eye watches, etc which uploads your vitals via wireless internet. Watson will eliminate the doctor's responsibility of misdiagnosis. Blame can be put on the computer or its programmers. But who exactly are these programmers? In a system like this, responsibility can be deferred indefinitely. A society that has put all of its trust in the recommendations of the IBM computer Watson, which can autonomously recommend diagnosis and recommend treatments with no responsibility to anyone and advise that certain patients receive no treatment whatsoever. In other words, a fully automated robotic death panel. One specific demographic is directly in the crosshairs of this new threat, U.S. veterans. According to an IBM News release from December 16, 2014, the U.S. Department of Veteran Affairs, VA, is using Watson technology in a pilot to assist physicians in helping accelerate the process of evidence-based medical decision-making. A tech startup, Recorded Future, that uses a system of filtering through and classifying open source data demonstrated their predictive analytics capability during the 2012 GeoInt conference. Trajectory Magazine reports, the concept is to find people who are talking about the future. Vice President for Recorded Future, Matt Kodima says, we can basically roll back the clock. We know that this particular did happen in this time at this place. Now let's go back a week before that and look at the publications. Who was predicting that accurately? Who wasn't? Add this layer of predictive analytics on top of the other human domain analytic and you begin to get an idea of the scope and range of the overarching, inescapable control grid these scientific controllers are constructing. At the same GeoInt conference in 2012, Jeff Jonas, the chief scientist for IBM Entity Analytics and an IBM fellow, talked about the potential for open source data utilization. He said, in typical IBM tradition, space, time, travel data is the ultimate biometric. It seems that IBM and the scientific elite's perspective shifted from the master race to mastering the human domain. So we probably won't see doors kicked in and military trucks 
shipping political opponents to their demise during this summer's Jade Helm 15 military procedure. However, as Brzezinski states in Between Two Ages, the technotronic era involves the gradual appearance of a more controlled society. Just like Watson's census was not the end sought by the Nazis, neither is Jade Helm 15 an end, but a means to a historically predictable end. We must also be alert to the equal and opposite danger that public policy could itself become the captive of a scientific, technological relief. In the councils of government, we must car guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. This is Jakari Jackson reporting for InfoWars.com. Have you ever been accused of just not being politically correct enough? Or do you feel like you're just a little out of touch in this new, perpetually offended USA? Well, that might be a case of unconscious bias. Much research points to the widespread existence of unconscious bias. But then there are the unconscious biases. Unconscious bias. Implicit racial bias. There's a new trend, a new term, unconscious bias. Or is it sometimes called implicit bias? That surprise and the behaviors associated with it are the product of something called unconscious bias. Everyone from government workers to private employees are all being compelled to take a good look at their unconscious minds and the hidden biases that lurk beneath. Experts claim that biases prevent employees from being productive and creative, while it hinders government employees' ability to make sound decisions. If the idea of the establishment evaluating your most hidden thoughts and emotions to determine if you're politically correct enough to function, that doesn't sit well with you, you're not alone. It's easy to dismiss the importance of the subject to the unconscious mind as simply a concept used by psychiatrists to better understand their patients. But we live in a world where you can't turn your head without being bombarded by some advertiser's attempt to influence our unconscious minds and behaviors. On top of the excessive attempts to manipulate our behavior through subliminal suggestions in the media, the psychiatric profession also serves the establishment as a convenient way to sidestep our entire judicial system with tools like the Hair Psychopath Checklist Revise, a PCLR, that they can use to directly incarcerate whoever they label as institutional. Criminal profiling has been a popular establishment tool since World War II. According to historian Gary Lockman, who stated in his 2010 book, Jung the Mystic, it was Carl Jung himself who in 1942 met with the one and only Alan Dulles and began a, quote, experimental marriage between espionage and psychology, unquote involving the psychological profile of political and military leaders. Shortly after, psychoanalyst Walter C. Langer submitted to the OSS, the predecessor to the CIA, a report that probed the psychology of Adolf Hitler. Thus, the institution of psychological profiling was born, and it has grown into an uncontrollable beast. We've all heard the controversy over the TSA profiling suspected terrorists or threats and how absolutely absurd it is to believe that the TSA can actually be trained to detect a person's inner agenda just by glancing at him in a busy airport terminal for about five seconds. Which brings us to the latest trend in psychological tyranny, the unconscious bias examination. The term was virtually unknown on the web just a few months ago. Now there are literally hundreds of articles on the subject. The articles are mostly pressuring large corporations to begin subjecting their employees to this degrading, unproven, intrusive requirement. And of course, the government is already forcing its own workers to evaluate their own unconscious minds. On March 19th, 2015, the Washington Times published an article entitled, Federal Workers Ordered to Probe Their Unconscious Bias. They say a top U.S. Forest Service executive told his employees to probe their own unconscious bias on everything from race and sexuality to the disabled and fat people, asking them to use an unproven assessment tool to explore their feelings. The online test, which the forest management director urged other agency directors to use as well, specifically warns of problems when it's taken outside of the safeguards of a research institution. 
Users are also told to be careful about how far to go in interpreting the results. In an AP article on March 9th of this year, titled Police Agencies Line Up to Learn About Unconscious Bias, we find that police from all over the country are now being flown to LA to a place called the Museum of Tolerance. There they can learn how to evaluate and control their unconscious bias before making any potentially biased, therefore bad or perhaps fatal decisions. The head of the Justice Department program that offers this training to police departments says without even a hint of irony in talking about the unconscious bias of the police, this is one tool that police leaders are using to help really ensure their agencies engage in conscious policing. According to the head of the Justice Department's Community Oriented Policing Services Program, the one offering the training. Nobody can argue that conscious policing is a good thing and in the midst of a tense situation, a conscious clear head is a requirement. But that's not what they're talking about. Some researchers caution that there's not enough evidence to show that implicit bias training is effective. As others have pointed out, this could potentially endanger officers by making them slower to recognize threats for fear of being called biased, or it could endanger the public by making them shoot even quicker. And they point out the training's benefits could quickly disappear when an officer gets back into the real world, or it could even increase racial bias in the long term. FBI Director James Comey said recently that rifts between police and communities can't be fully bridged until we acknowledge unconscious bias. Much research points to the widespread existence of unconscious bias. If we can't help our latent biases, we can help our behavior in response to those instinctive reactions. What about holding police accountable for their actions? Wouldn't that be a better start than an abstract examination into a police officer's mind that might impair his reaction time, putting him in grave danger? There's also a huge push for the private sector to utilize this technique for increased creativity and productivity, and not surprisingly, to root out any potential gender issues that are floating around just below the surface. Administering an exam based on unproven techniques that can affect a person's employment status sounds like a recipe for disaster. Let's not forget about the other possible consequences of introducing a compulsory system and probing a person's unconscious mind in an inappropriate setting, in this case, the workplace. Forcing people to examine their minds in this way when they're not prepared in this kind of a setting can involuntarily surface repressed emotions, memories, trauma. Without the aid of a trained professional to help deal correctly with these lost feelings, a person can experience what is known as re-traumatization and cause a person to go into deep depression, nervous breakdown, or even suicide. And finally, this kind of testing at work opens the possibilities for singling people out. If the police training facility called the Museum of Tolerance doesn't raise the Orwellian eyebrow, just think about the fact that the unthought is still a thought crime. Someone can be labeled, stigmatized, have their life ruined, all based on a test that, without proof, alleges to detect hidden thoughts, feelings, and motivations. Just a few months back, then Attorney General Eric Holder used unconscious bias to describe racial bias present in the Ferguson police force. Our review of the evidence found no, no alternative explanation for the disproportionate impact on African American residents other than implicit and explicit racial bias. It's clear that the establishment has been toying with this new tool for a little while, and they're rolling it out now. Considering how abusive the government is with other methods provided to them by the psychiatric profession, imagine how much more abusive it will get when everywhere you go, you will not only be judged for your actions and thoughts, but also judged for thoughts that others claim you have the potential for having. It would be a mistake not to observe how the media is bombarding us with headlines associating the term unconscious bias, mostly with gender bias, just as Hillary Clinton begins her campaign using gender bias as her campaign crutch. Remember, Hillary is proposing government fun camps for adults to go to and be re-educated into a functional member of society, the type without any unauthorized biases. I have decided we really need camps for adults. The unconscious bias exam might just be the perfect tool for singling out anyone they want and dragging them away into a government camp.
So even though we could incarcerate the wrong person, we could destroy due process, we could have an all-out Orwellian tyranny, many experts say there could be something positive in this for society. Well, I've got an idea of what we could do that would be positive. How about we use it to screen potential leaders to see if they're psychologically sound? After all, we don't want our president to be a psychopath. We could even call it the Dr. Strangelove test. For InfoWars Nightly News, I'm David Knight. Okay, we're going to play a little game of Is That Racist? InfoWars. Oh my gosh, I do this <laughs> all the time uh, online. So you might be a little biased. All right, so we <laughs> are playing a game okay. today, asking people out here to flip through these photos okay. and say if it's racist or not. Okay. And you flip through the photos and just say yes or no, it's racist. That's complicated. No. Oh. No. Is this racist to me? Let me know, racist or not? No, ma'am. Of course, yes, the symbol is racist. So, so the General Lee up from the Dukes of Hazard, this car is racist? I would say, yeah. So are Daisy Dukes racist? No. Those are great. Yeah! Yes racist. or no? Definitely racist. Um, that's, that's just, just kind of confusing, yeah. <laughs> um, I like cats, but... Yeah, nah. that's... No. No. Peanut butter jelly is so delicious. Now that is racist. No, I was kidding. No. <laughs> no. Heck no. I don't know. The city of Portland has decided that using peanut butter and jelly sandwiches as an example is a racial microaggression. Some cultures did not grow up eating peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. So that makes them racist. Racial. It's microaggressive. Microaggressive. Okay, so I guess. Different levels to racism. That's ridiculous because, I mean, I, I really feel like people have redefined racism. You know, if, if I have control and power over you, that would be, ra for, because of the color of your skin, that would be racist. But a sandwich, I mean, people don't even know what words mean anymore. And it, it's really irritating me, like hatred. Oh, you hate me because you don't agree or you don't like the way I live. That's hatred, you know. So it's, it's silly. I ain't gonna be no banker's slave. I ain't gonna be no banker's slave. Robin Peter Chu Pay Paul from the cradle to the grave. I ain't gonna be no banker's slave. Pretty sure that's yeah, a little, pretty sure a lot of people are not too sure racist. Uh, Kanye West is just a very confused man. <laughs> He's doesn't, a racist. Doesn't doesn't know what's up or down. Um, I'm That's guessing Kid this is Rock. Kid Rock. Uh, he's just, you know, a he little white trash. Even know, they don't, most of these people don't white even trash. know the meaning behind that Confederate flag. I mean, the flag represents, I agree, it represents slavery. I think it shouldn't really be a symbol of, uh, in, an, in an everyday life. I'm sorry, but the Stars and Bars was never flown as the national flag of the Confederacy. It was the flag of the Army of Northern Virginia. And uh, it, it was the battle flag. Correct. It was the battle flag of the Confederate Army. Like I said before, who most of the people who fought for that army never owned a slave. Granted, the aristocrats did, but like I said, it was on the way out. Slavery was an outdated institution, you know? You sound like a terrorist. I just might be. <laughs> Obviously, him, Little John, has the same idea of this is the South. That's what they were for. I understood that when I saw it. So, a paper bag. Brown bag. <laughs> Brown paper bag. No. How could this be racist? Well, it's a racial slur, according to uh, the As city of Seattle. As in for? You're not allowed to brown bag your lunch. Brown bag your lunch. That is not racist. I mean, I ever heard that term? I did. I have. I have. Okay. If you are, if you're darker than the brown paper bag, then you're too dark. But but white people didn't start that. That was something that black people did. Wow. So yeah, I, how could that be racist? You're educating me right now. Yes, that had nothing to do with white people. Um, when we were kids, it, you know, black kids are taught that being dark is bad, and that is. I've never heard that from a white person. I heard that from other black people. If I saw you walking down the street and you had it on, you're a Caucasian person, either you're saying, unless you approach me, hey, how you doing? I'll shake your hand. I can care less. It doesn't matter now. If you're not trying to, you know, be around me, avoid me, or you cross the street and you have this on, 
I know to stand clear of you. I see you. That's what you're wearing. That's what you represent. I understand it now. Do you think this is more like a divide and conquer sort of diversion thing? Do you think there are more important things people should be it's worried about? Way more important things. You announce, and I, my best friend is gay. You announce the gay, uh, like it's legal everywhere on the same day that the guy was being buried. Uh, the preacher was being buried. So to me, I just think it's a way, yeah, it's a diversion. This flag been up for years, maybe just as long as American flag has been waving or whatever. And nobody never brought this into context. KKK been around things like that and now you bring it up when you have the bigger issue is a young man literally a racial act happened he said it happened he went in there with intention on killing people but now you bring this just to get everybody conversating that's all it is this is a diversion americans don't want to be informed they want to be entertained so this is entertainment i'd rather live poor and be free i'd rather live poor and be free live in some cage in the lap of luxury I'd rather live poor and be free I said I'd want to be a billionaire A lot of people are really addicted to social media but could there actually be a social network out there that is for the people? Well, my guest today, Bill Ottman, is the founder and CEO of Minds.com. It's a new social network that's very similar to a lot of other platforms that you might be familiar with. But Minds.com sets themselves apart because they encrypt all of their messages, thereby keeping it safe from the prying eyes of advertisers and government agencies. So, Bill, welcome to the show. Now, I'm very skeptical about any social network that's out there. So what is going to set Minds apart from the rest? Sure. So Minds is a free, open source, and encrypted social networking platform that actually rewards people with viral reach just for using the app. And it's democratically powered by the people through voting tools that we have on the site. So... You know, most status quo social networks, you really don't get anything out of them. In fact, they're exploiting you with corrupt algorithms and surveillance. So between the fact that we're sharing our code, we don't have any access to user conversations, zero knowledge. We wanted to take ourselves out of that equation entirely. And the fact that just for using the app, you're increasing your reach so that more people can get um, can view your content. Right. Well, because that was a big issue with the CIA funded Facebook was that they sort of got everyone hooked and and really sucked in to this huge platform. And then they just flipped with this new algorithm that really kind of suppressed the information. And it was more of a pay to play type of a platform, which caused a lot of companies to tank, actually. So now talking about your encryption, I mean, how do you how do you know this isn't going to get hacked How strong is this encryption? Like, what would crypto experts say? Sure. So we already have people in the peer review community checking out our code. If you go to minds.org, actually, it's we just put it up, but it's sort of the skeleton of the governance and code model. So you can actually check out a bunch of the code there right now in terms of the encryption. And we're releasing all the code this year. Now, no encryption, to, to claim that it's perfect encryption, that would just be ridiculous to say because encryption is an end. And actually allowing the community to inspect our code, it's the best that we can do compared to all other social networks. I mean, other networks will say that they're private and encrypted, but because their code is proprietary, they're not allowing the peer review community to inspect the code so there are back doors into your system. So you're kind of in this beta beta testing stage right now. So you have uh, people going in, experts looking at the code and saying, well, there's a vulnerability here. There's a, a flaw, a design flaw here. And are you sort of taking all that feedback and, and fixing it at that point, uh, strengthening the encryption? Absolutely. We've already had a bunch of security researchers contact us privately about certain possible vulnerabilities. We've never been hacked to this point, so um, that sort of stands for itself, but we don't, we wouldn't claim to be hack-proof. Nobody is hack-proof, but we've had some great commentary on, uh, there's a platform called Git, which 
allows programmers all over the world to collaborate on code. So we've already received some great suggestions there, and that's only going to keep amplifying. Right, because there was kind of a little bit of uh, feedback with the online. I was seeing a lot of different anonymous groups out there sort of doing a little bit of infighting, saying, you know, anonymous they're claiming that we all support this program, but, you know, obviously it's not a, an organization. It's it's more of an idea. So, you know, I've seen one of the bigger anonymous groups out there on Twitter saying, well, any social network is going to be CIA, especially if they say, trust us, uh, something like that. So so what do you want to say to people out there that are, are kind of pushing you as the next Facebook? And, you know, I mean, I guess you're saying right now you're not claiming to be totally hack proof, but you're trying Right. First of all, we're not saying trust us. I mean, <laughs> the, we, we think that we're sort of doing everything we can by being transparent in this way. And, you know, the media sort of ran with the whole anonymous story because certain groups of anonymous do support what we're doing. And there's tons of anonymous accounts on the site. We allow anonymous accounts. You don't have to use your real name. You don't even have to use a real email. So definitely elements of anonym, anonymous do support us, but others are being skeptical, and that's good. We think that, I mean, for everybody to just blindly say, oh, yeah, go for it, um, you know, don't second-guess everything, they should question what we're doing, and we want that process to keep happening. Right, and that's why I think what you're doing is so important, because allowing people to have access, you know, this open-source platform, it's allowing people to be a part of the solution, so describe to me, you know, why is it so important for people to understand the code that they're interacting with? Sure. So every time you turn on your computer, every time you open a browser, every time you log into an app, you're empowering a corporation with your energy and your activity on that network. So when, when people are using proprietary browsers like Chrome or Safari or, you know, um, when this, all of these, every time you log in, you're empowering them. So we're saying it's not just about using minds. It's about using all free and open source platforms, whether it's Firefox for your browser or Ubuntu for my browser, for my operating system. This is, these are empowering open companies, Wikipedia. They took out all the proprietary encyclopedias and that has been a great thing for humanity in general. It's about having access to information about the products that we're consuming. So it's really, if you're consuming an app or consuming an apple, <laughs> it's kind of the same kind of situation. Right, and, and whether we like it or not, every single thing that we're going to be interacting with in the future is, is going to have some sort of a code. Uh, you know, they're talking about now swallowing chips in order to have a biometric password or, or nanobots uh, to to be injected and, and help with health issues and things like that. So all of these things are going to have code in them. And so here, you know, if it's proprietary, you have no idea if that nanobot has some sort of a backdoor into an advertiser or some sort of corporation or I mean, things we can't even comprehend at this at this point right now. So you know, what do you think about that? Facebook is is actively talking about hooking everyone up to uh, virtual reality, basically saying that at some point, you know, the things that you think your friends will immediately be able to experience it and things like that. I mean, wh what does that say for the future? What do you think people should be concerned with? Sure. Yeah, all of that stuff is really incredible. And it's sort of inevitable. Now, the double edged sword, because it's solving health problems, but it also has these potential threats if the code is proprietary. So, so I guess you would call it transhumanist implants that you can get that are ethical and others that are proprietary. And so you actually don't know if they have backdoors into your biology, which is incredible to think about. Um, but it's already happening now. People are already getting uh, implants for vision and hearing, and it's doing incredible things um, but it's also doing potentially very threatening things. Right. And so that's kind of why, you know, normally I wouldn't really ever advocate for any social networks out there, but I think I really do appreciate what you guys are trying to do, kind of being for, by the people, for the people with this, allowing people to get in, look at the code, inspect it for themselves, see what's really going on, see if there's any backdoors. And I guess, you know, I'm sure there are going to be some ultimate 
ultra hackers out there that are going to be able to figure some stuff out. Uh, but I, I, I agree with you. It is it kind of with the organic food movement. You've got to know what you're interacting with, what you're putting in your body, what you're using, because you are empowering whatever corporation or whatever entity that is that you're interacting with. So here, this is kind of a conscious social network, a conscious platform. So Bill, what else would you like to say about Minds.com and and letting people know about how they can be part of this open source solution? Sure. So it's really about empowering free open source and encrypted networks. It's not just about Minds. We would love for people to help our movement, but what we think is that the ultimate top social network in the world should be free, open source, decentralized. And it's really a federation of all of the different uh, free and open source projects happening in the world. It's, 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 all these platforms are going to come together to create this top network. Um, so, yeah, I would just encourage people to use Firefox, uh, use Tor, use Minds, use Diaspora, use all the other federated free and open source networks um, use GNU Linux for your operating system. I'm using Ubuntu right now. You, you don't think that it makes a difference, but you know, if you're booting up into Apple and Microsoft products, you're empowering them and it's just not. Ne- right. And it's, it's just as good. Yeah. Uh, well, <laughs> <laughs> Oh God. All right. So if you're plugging into Apple and Microsoft, so start there. Right. So if you're plugging into Apple and Microsoft when you boot up your computer, it's sort of this probably unconscious thing. People don't realize they think, oh, I have to use those. Those are the best out there. But really, you can use GNU Linux, uh, which have, has tons of distributions for your operating system. I use Ubuntu. There's another one called Debian. There's Tails. They're just as easy to install. And every time you boot up your computer, you're supporting these conscious projects. Um, And so, yeah, again, it's just about being conscious of what we're consuming and sort of voting with our dollars, voting with our energy. Absolutely. And we can see just how the organic food movement has taken off the same the same thing. People voting with their dollars or people choosing to tune into alternative media rather than consuming uh, lamestream dinosaur media for all of their news. That's what it's all about. There are power in numbers, and it is all about being conscious of what you're investing your energy into and absolutely fighting for the future because it doesn't belong to just those people who want to control it. Well, Bill, thank you so much, uh, founder of Minds.com. Thanks for having me. Well, thank you for tuning into the show tonight. Enjoy your 4th of July holiday. Celebrate your freedom while you still can and wave those American flags while they're still not considered racist. 